Hello! As you can tell from my very snazzy reflective vest, uh, I'm currently at a building site. Uh, in three days though, this building site, which is in Clifton Downs, Bristol, will be host to thousands of people coming to see Hometown Heroes Massive Attack play their first gig in over five years. Uh, and this isn't just a return to the stage for the music legends. This is also set to be the lowest carbon emitting show of its size ever. So to explain why they've done this, I'm joined by Massive Attack's Robert Denier, AKA 3D. Obviously, Act 1.5 is yeah. a climate activator. When were you first inspired to climate action in general? I think Mark, who you've met, my partner in this, um, we met through various activism, uh, moments of act activism. You know, we met on the Iraq war demo. We, wor we worked with the guys at Occupy, with Hoping, the Hoping Foundation for Palestine, and, and then with XR. You know, we kind of were there on the first, the first days of the XR sort of like uh, lockdowns. And that was probably the, one of the things that inspired us to take more action in our sector because our sector was always present at festivals talking about climate change, but within itself, very little activity, very little action was being taken. So we thought, okay, what can we do to, to move the fucking dial right along? Where were the first seeds of this event born then? Well, when, I think when we first spoke to the, the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research, when we, act, when, commit, when we commissioned that report, it was inevitable that the way to sort of like the, the next stage of that report being brought to life was a manifestation of a gig that's doing it ourselves. Because obviously we're in a sector where promoters hold a lot of power. Um, and as much as we're banging on that door, it's very difficult to, to get any, to get a response. Um, and we're also in a sector where there is a, a, a lot of activity around climate conversation. Uh, sort of what I like to call climate conversation industrial complex, which is predicated on taking a lot of public money to keep talking about it, making pledges and, and sort of like, you know, working out how to sort of like, how can we measure our emissions? Well, we've done that with the Tyndall Centre have actually worked it out. They've actually written a report on the sector. So let, let's actually put it into action. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of those groups, they mean well, they actually do that. They really hold the whole project back because it means the promoters don't have to take immediate action. They say, okay, let's wait until, let's, let's, let's do some more measurements, shall we? Should we measure the impact of our sector? And let's do that for another couple of years, make some more pledges. Meanwhile, nothing's happening, no action, no act, you know, nothing's changing. So we've, we felt it was time to sort of just get over those obstacles and, and put it into action. One of the first things we did was, was meet, you know, really interesting um, industrial partners. You know, we've always looked at festivals and wondered why the sponsors were so kind of bizarrely non-compatible with the, the cultural event that was taking place. And we thought, well, let's change that. And, you know, we've been very fortunate to meet some really brilliant industrial partners. And then you have to get local authorities on board as well, because you need their support, because they're the ones that give out the licenses, right? So that's been the mission to get this, this up and running. Which, what kind of partners? Let's dig into them a bit. So we've got Ecotricity. So Dale Vince has been a uniquely brilliant partner because... Partner with me as well. <laughs> Serves my house. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, do you know what I mean? And, and, De and, and you know, Dale's unique in lots of ways. You know, his own history as an activist himself means that you, you're not having to, you know, we're, all on, we're on the same page, right? So he works in a, in, a, in a highly sort of competitive commercial energy delivery business. And so he knows how the game works. So when you talk to him about how to make changes and how to sort of like disrupt something, he knows he's done all that. So he's a, he's a brilliant partner. Zenobi, who's supplying a lot of the batteries for this show, have been absolutely brilliant. The, the electric buses, Volta electric trucks, and you need those partners to make this stuff happen. But you, what you really need is the promoters to be prepared to sort of like spend a little bit more money and not worry so much about the shareholders and the bottom line to actually put these partnerships together. Mm -hmm. And to then go to the local authorities like we would and say, we've got a Paris compatible plan. The problem is at the moment, there's lots of non-Paris compatible plans being presented to local authorities way before we get in the door. And those authorities are saying, oh no, we've got a plan. We've got, we've, got a plan for, uh, we've got a plan for 2025. We're, we're going to write a report. But then we, the report's written, we're putting it into action. This event has happened. It's going into action. There's a, there's a kind of feeling that we have very little interest from the local authority here until the election. Mm. You know, we've approached the mayor's office. We approached the local MP. And now we've got a new green MP. That, that's changed a bit. So that conversation can be deepened. That relationship can be deepened. But we don't want, on the day after this event, for everything just to reset back to how it was. It's ridiculous. I mean, the batteries, unfortunately, are being removed 
from the site the day after the event and diesel generators are moving in. So we're, we're very frustrated that we, that just couldn't be, it seems completely crazy that batteries aren't staying on site. So you're saying when you approached the local Labour MP and Bristol Council with a plan saying like this is in accordance with the Paris Agreement, Paris Accords, whatever, um, they weren't interested. It's only now you've got a Green MP that you're hearing much more back. I mean, to be honest, even, we've re, we, they know everyone is aware of what we're doing here. We've made it very public. Um, but even so, the plan for Bristol for the next year, which has already been sort of like drawn up and agreed by the council, by the cultural sector, without the environmental sector's knowledge, isn't Paris compatible. So that's deeply frustrating to us, um, which is why we've, we've opened up a lot more meaningful relationships with Liverpool, London and Manchester, which is a shame because this is our local city, it's our town. Mm. Bristol has a reputation for radicalism and climate radicalism even. Yeah. Why do you think it's not living up to it? I think Bristol has, Bristol has two identities that coexist. One is that radical identity and one is a very sort of like, it's a very old structural identity, which you could call the City Fathers. The, the, it's, a, it's a very conservative setup in this city, do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, it's very hard to break in, so no matter who becomes the new council, everyone seems to fit, sit in those seats and starts to behave the same way. So we're, trying, we're hoping at this particular point that isn't going to be the case. With, the, with Carla as the Green MP, we can really sort of like, you know, break that open a bit. But the scaffolding is always there in the background. And someone asks, you know, why is that energy in Bristol, that energy of sort of like, that sort of radically rebellious sort of energy in the city? And one of the answers is that because the structure, because the sort of like the structure of the city is so rigid, you have to make that energy around it to sort of avoid those, yeah. those beams. What about reception from, you know, your peers in the music industry or the promoters, et cetera? Right now, the world's biggest pop star is quite famous for jetting around in her private plane, and that's just sort of brushed off as normal. I mean, we, we tend not to sort of like look at what the other artists are doing. If, if their projects are Paris compatible, then, then Tinder will tell us about it, say there's another really cool project. You guys should look at it and we'll make contact. We've, obviously this report has been written by climate scientists for the whole sector and we've presented it to the sector and the Act 1.5 project has presented recommendations and solutions to the recommendations in the report. It's, that sounds really quite sort of like, sort of bureaucratic when I say that, but it is, and it really, a lot of this stuff isn't very glamorous. It is the stuff you can do now. It's, it's, how to, it's how to put stuff into action. Um, Palestine's going to be front and centre as well, as well as this being a you know, climate festival, a uh, festival that looks at sort of like the history of Brits, Bristol's politics. Yeah. Why was that important for you guys? We've always been strongly supportive of the Palestinian cause. You know, we, as a band, we travelled to Israel in the late 90s twice and were witness to a, a very, what we saw as an apartheid type culture and society split by an apartheid type system back then in the 90s. Um, we refused to go back there on our own terms before, you know, it was, wasn't because we were pressured by BDS. We just we said to our agent, we're not going back, sorry. After many requests, we, you know, we had, you know, we, we had personal, also very personal issues with what we saw, like quite overt racism in, in Tel Aviv to the, the black guys in the band as well. So we had that personal experience too. So we, you know, We've, we've strongly supported the Palestinian cause for the last 20 years. So right now, at this particular, this particular year in, in question, obviously, you know, we want to do as, as much as we can to keep the, the kind of the discourse going, to sort of like share with the Palestinian population. In the music industry, is, it, is there a taboo on talking about Palestine? I've seen people be shut down for it before. It's the first time, I, th I think this year, I had noticed, I had journalists contacting me personally saying, will you please not post certain things which I found was stepping over a big line for me. Um, that's never happened before. So it, things changed this year quite dramatically. Um, I think there is a certain amount of anxiety around it, but I, I, I don't think there need be. I think people need at this particular point to be the loudest voices. They need to step up. They need to speak about it. Also, I, I spoke a lot to John, I was communicating with John Glazer yeah. around his post Oscars speech. And it was just the culture that started to appear around the ability to be able to speak your mind mm. in, especially while witnessing something, it's the horror that was unfolding and it's still unfolding, to be told not to speak about it was just, I found remarkably terrifying. Do you see these things as knitted together, you know, climate action, Palestine, the other sort of like radical politics that are going to be on the lineup for Sunday? Yeah, oh, absolutely everything's knitted. I mean, you know, you, you're talking about a, a problem with, you know, capitalism within our, our kind of, our democracies, right? And the imbalance between what should be a very simple 
let's 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 re let's let's redistribute wealth equitably by maybe nationalizing some industries right so we're not letting the markets destroy them we've seen that with water with trains and in fact working with GWR on the trains and trying to talk to promoters about trying to get across Europe it, it's, it's difficult because the trains have been decimated because the subsidies to airlines have been just so so you know for the last 20 years the airlines have become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper the trains have suffered and it's very difficult now to sort of try to kind of change the direction of that that economy but as I've been told we're in a carbon economy we can't change overnight we need to keep putting pressure on but I think you can see the direct results of Tory capitalism and, and letting the markets control the economy and, and also letting that, that the political class, the media class, dictate that to the population, to divide people, to keep, you know, to keep, to sort of like, to go into that cliche about blaming the person next door instead of the, the economic mm. crisis, which is not something which has to be manifestly sort of like presented to us. There are different ways of doing it. We know, we know that their socialism is always available when it comes to bailing out companies and banks, right? There's always that possibility. So why is it not handed out? Why is the welfare state not, and the NHS and the public services not sort of given that privilege? Yeah, I just want to pick up on what you said as well about transport, because obviously you can keep everything as low carbon as possible when people are on site, but when they're off site, that's a different story. But you've, you guys have tried to go a bit farther with sorting out sort of transport to the gig. Yeah, exactly. You know, we're aware that our this behaviour sort of like in well, this this sort of this this event will create scope three, as they call behaviour, and the audience getting around and their behaviour and how to get to gigs. So we try to control you know, to manage that as much much as we can. So no car parking, train incentivised bundled tickets with trains, electric transport shuttles, and, and also choosing a site which is accessible by public transport by foot is important in the first place. Those electric transport shuttles were they brought to life for? Be a festival no they exist it's just that you have to have a conversation with those industries and say can we use them and a lot of the time we found in this experiment if you will that by going to say a, a, a rail network provider and saying can we can we can we get some trains can we can we organize some coaches like, yeah of course you can it's that simple but why hasn't that happened before because no one's asked us you know and, and it's just it's just having that having that conversation talking to people about it and ask making asking those questions making that you know forming those relationships Sunday's lineup has people like Sam Morton, and Killer Mike. How did you select the headliners? I mean, we're always looking for people we find inspiring that are also compatible politically, but that's not important if we don't share the same politics necessarily. But compatibility, people that inspire us, Lancome, other people that have voices and they're using their voices. Killer Mike, Lancome also using their voices, very loud, very amplified. So we, we're big fans of that. This is your first show in five years. Is it your in last in Bristol? First in eight years. In eight years. Yeah. First in eight years, okay. First in eight years in Bristol. Is it your last show? I, not our last show, potentially, but let's say it's probably the last time we attempt something this ambitious in Bristol because there's other things we need to do as well. And the project, the At 1.5 project, will continue and, and move into different places. What will that look like? What are there some other things? Can you give us a teaser? I can't really. I'm not at liberty to explain it right now, but... The next, the next stage of the project will, will come clear in Liverpool in November. Obviously, you came up with a load of 90s ravers. Mm -hmm. Do you think your political journey has been mirrored by that of your fan base? I don't know. That's really weird. But man, I came out of sort of the late end of the punk movement and then discovered hip hop and, and, and sort of like, you know, was really obsessed with the music coming from across the Atlantic. And of course, then when the rave scene happens, that all that followed the warehouse parties being shut down in in the cities as they moved into the rural areas and and the summer of love happened. So it changed the way football fans were. You know, the football fan experience completely changed overnight. But I'm not sure politically if we're all on the same page anymore with my generation. Why do you think that is? Why there's been such a polarization? I, I, do you know? What? I I think it's a sort of inflicted polarization. I think I think it's a mirage that polarization. I think if you speak to a lot of people and you actually were to sit down and analyse what we see as the differences. There are not that many differences. I, I, I think that the discourse has been polluted deliberately by bad actors, as we know. We know what's happening in social media. We know what's happened with the recent far-right manifestations in the country. Um, we know a lot of the identities behind those, those, those the kind of like those disruptions, right? I think if you were to sit down with, the, with a lot of the people that attend football matches that have what seem to be extreme views, and you actually drill down, they'd probably be, you'd find they weren't as extreme as you thought they were. But there's a lot of frustration, there's a lot of poverty, 
there's a lot of dispossession. There's a lot of there's a lot of a lack of faith in the political system anymore. You know, which I think we've watched, and that's not that's not by accident. You know, that is not by accident. And you know, that that cl a classic phrase that the culture war keeps our mind off the class war is is not is not far from a kind of truth. It's it's glib, and it's crass, but there's a truth in there as well. Were you surprised by the sort of uh outpouring of far-right affiliated violence, not necessarily directly far-right, that happened in Bristol. Yeah, it's shocking, um, but it's not surprising. You know, you can see you can, if, I think that I know from my own, my own groups of people that I've, I've communicate with, that I've seen their behaviors change on social media in the last 10 years alone. And a lot of their, a lot of the things they share automatically, not because, not because they'd written them themselves or the authors of such material, but because it's easy to share it and pass it along because people are, were frustrated during the pandemic and they started to believe in things that were materializing around them they had no control over do you know what i mean so i can see where these these behaviors formed and came from but it was shocking to see how it manifested itself in bristol and you saw the response from bristol a week later and and that's the city i recognize you mentioned carl denia do you have hope that party politics might still provide a solution to the climate crisis i do i, I it has to you know it's across all sectors, but we need to sort of like change the way we, we run our economy. We have to change the way we allow the, pro the markets to run our, our, our national services. You know what I mean? We're not gonna be able to change anything while the markets are running it. We need to, I'm not saying everything needs to be nationalized. I'm not sort of saying we're gonna become a sort of like a socialist state overnight, but we do need to intervene dramatically. And like this stuff, you know, legislation's like a dirty word, but sometimes legislation will stop things stop the, to, to change the way things are done. Sometimes it's the only way shit happens, do you know what I mean? And finally, you said you don't want this to be a one-off situation, who's just come to you and then forget. How can they take home the spirit of this activation? I think it's by, by being present, really, just being part of this is, is being, I wouldn't say that being here, becoming an act, is an act, of, an act of being an activist by buying a ticket, but being here and being involved in it and buying that ticket has helped us put this on. So there is a, a, a sense that, that 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 participation is already in there.